I see no gates or locks on this sad world. Why then do I find it so hard to leave? The woman had fled to the next room, locked the partition behind her, and disappeared. To be so consumed with desire was to fall knowingly into the trap she had prepared for him, but he could not stop himself as he was lured, step by step, into doing exactly what she wanted. Looking back, he realised that he might never meet such an elegant and endearing woman again, but his love for her had largely been fulfilled. He could never say about any woman that he had known the full extent of her charms, that he had exhausted the dreams they shared, that she no longer interested him at all, but he felt more strangely drawn by far to the unknown woman, to the woman who was driven to employ one technique after another in fanning his passion. The psychology of the sensualist is always the same, whether he is an aristocrat of the ancient court or an Edo period sophisticate, he will not concern himself with a woman he has left behind. Anyone reaching a certain age will be moved to tears of joy when a young person says a few kind words. Not only did he feel that he was cheating a naive wife, he realised that his own happiness was built on his wife's sacrifice. Gazing at her as he held these secret doubts, he found her face even more mysterious, more enigmatic than before. The old man could not suppress a feeling of pride when he considered that he monopolised such a treasure, that no one but he, apparently not even the lady herself, knew that the world held such beauty. He would be satisfied to gaze at her face until he died, but it would be a pity and a waste to allow her young flesh to decay along with his. The world held too many women bewailing their miserable fates for one to take pity on each of them. He could no longer overlook the enormity of a man like him monopolising such a woman. A woman's youth and beauty were finite. Rather than keep her waiting for him to die, he would henceforth consider himself dead and devote himself to brightening her life. A dead man will watch from the grave over the fortunes of the loved ones he has left behind. He would assume this attitude even as he lived. Haiju's yearning was probably stimulated by the ladies having become a flower on a mountain peak, far beyond his reach. With whom did I pledge my love in the waking world? On a fleeting path of dreams I wander, doubting who I am. She might be a flawless beauty, he thought, but if he could see proof that she was an ordinary human being, he would awaken from the dream that he had wandered so far into and lose interest in her. There is no telling how far a man's fortunes will turn once they begin to go bad. Despite his reputation, Haiju had no success in love after he inhaled the fragrance of Jiju's chamber pot. It was one failure after another for him. To make matters worse, Jiju grew steadily more haughty and cruel. The hotter he became, the colder her rebuffs. When he was almost there, she would push him away. As a result, poor Haiju fell ill and worried himself to death. I cannot rest until I make her mine, Haiju thought, and bewildered by love, he presently fell ill, tormented. He finally died. There have been many instances since ancient times of wise men suffering misfortune at the hands of small men. He also exchanged pledges with a woman named Yukon, a daughter of the Suenawa lesser captain, while she was still in service at the Imperial Palace, but he abruptly stopped visiting her when she resigned her post and returned to her family. She wrote to him, I hear that he lives, who pledged never to forget. I wonder where the words that he uttered have gone. Instead of writing a reply, 
he sent her a pheasant. She wrote to him again, more cautious than the morning pheasant, avoiding the hunter as it rises. On Mount Kurikoma, I had not thought to be captured by you again. Sukemasa's mother died giving birth to him, and he was placed with his aunt. His childhood name was Azuma. Atsutada went to see him in his second year. Weeping profusely, he composed this poem. Before we could speak our hearts, we parted, and my keepsake of her is Azuma. Mother, to him, was nothing more than the memory of a tearful face that he had glimpsed in his fifth year, and the sensory awareness of her fragrant incense. For forty years, memory and awareness were cherished, gradually beautified into an ideal, and purified until they had become something vastly different from the reality. Unless I study the ascetic dharma, how shall I forget this heart? Restless, I know the length of the night. When the chapel was too quiet, the nurse would say, Young master, go take a peek at your father and see what he's doing. Shigemoto would approach the chapel fearfully, kneel at the threshold, put his hand silently to the partition, and slide it open an inch. A painting of the Bodhisattva, Samantabhadra, hung on the wall directly opposite. Facing it was his father, seated stiffly and perfectly still. Shigamoto could see only his father's back, though he watched for some time. His father neither recited a sutra, looked at a book, nor burned incense. He just sat in silence. What is father doing? Shigamoto asked his nurse. He's practicing what is called the contemplation of impurity, she replied. Since the contemplation of impurity involves an exceedingly difficult theory, the nurse was not able to give a full explanation. In brief, a person who practices the contemplation of impurity will come to understand that the various carnal pleasures of mankind are nothing more than momentary illusions whereupon he will no longer find his beloved lovable, and he will know that things beautiful to behold, delicious to eat, or pleasing to smell, are in fact not beautiful, delicious, or pleasing, but are filthy things. Your father is practicing this discipline, the nurse said, because he is trying to get over the loss of your mother. The men died off who had felt such dreadful passion for her, it is more unnerving to encounter a beautiful young woman walking alone at night on a dark, lonely road than to meet a man in the same circumstances. In a reverie, he brushed aside the carrier branch she held and pressed his face closer to hers. The fragrance of incense in the sleeves of her black robe recalled to him that lingering scent of long ago, and like a child secure in his mother's love, he wiped his tears again and again with her sleeve.